Good evening, everybody. I'm Joyce Cairns, President of the Royal Scottish Academy. And on behalf of the RSC, I'm delighted to welcome you to the George Square Lecture Theatre for our seventh uh, Metstein Architecture Discourse, which tonight will be delivered by our most honoured guest and speaker, Josie Raphael Moneo. For those of you who don't know the history of this event, the annual Met Scene Discourse was the original idea of Richard Murphy, RSA, and inaugurated by the Royal Scottish Academy in memory of Professor Izzy Metstein, RSA, a remarkable architect, a teacher, conversationalist, and a huge supporter and former treasurer of the Academy. Izzy, with his partner, Professor Andy McMillan, RSA, worked in Glasgow um, the Glasgow practice of Gillespie, Kidd and Coya, who between them have left some influential and extraordinary buildings. In his role as a teacher and critic, he inspired a whole generation of architectural students in the Macintosh School of Architecture in Glasgow, the University of Dublin, and here at the University of Edinburgh as Professor of Architecture from 1984 to 1991. He was also part of the Architecture Association in London. His insights, scrutiny, sense of humour, acerbic wit touched all of us, and he's still very much missed by us all in the Academy. I wish, as always, to extend a very warm welcome to Izzy's wife, Danny, who's sitting over there, son Saul, daughter Ruth, who are in the audience tonight, and thank them for their continued support. Before we proceed to the main event of the evening, the RSA would like to take this opportunity to mention those who have helped towards making the 2022 discourse happen. We thank Ian Gilzean, Chief Architect, and Sandy Robinson, Principal Architect of the Scottish Government, for their continued financial support and commitment to the discourse. We are grateful to Edinburgh University for their cooperation and use of this splendid lecture theatre. We also thank RSA academicians Tom Connolly, Director of Elder Plus uh, uh, Canon Architects, and Henry McEwen of GM Architects for their tireless efforts and research, which took them on an extraordinary journey by plane, train, and bus through France. <laughs> through France to San Sebastian and then across many miles by bus to Madrid to interview Mineo in all of about three or four days. We congratulate, congratulate them, Julia Radcliffe McEwen and Thomas Woodcock on all their hard work in formulating the excellent and informative publication recording Mineo's career, buildings, achievements, um, and it's on here at sale today, so please buy them. Finally, thank you to Colin Greensglade, the RSA Director, and to Matt Hill, our super efficient Academy Administrator, for his invaluable assistance and patience, which he's had a lot, had needed to have a lot of, with all during the organisation of this first class event. Previously, we've been honoured to host six eminent speakers, Alvaro Siza from Portugal, Glenn Murcutt from Australia, Peter Zumtar from Switzerland, Sir David Chipperfield from London, the Grafton architects Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McMara from Ireland, and in 2019 we had Kettle Thorson from Snohetta Architects based in Oslo and New York. This year we've gone to Madrid and the Royal Scottish Academy are very honoured and delighted to welcome Josie Rafael Mineo, um, who uh, the internationally renowned Spanish architect, educator, and winner of many international awards, including the Pritzker Architecture Prize. I'm now going to hand over to Tom Conley, who will formally introduce um, Rafael, uh, Rafael Maneo to deliver the 2022 Metstein Lecture. Okay. Thank you, Joyce. No pressure then, eh? Firstly, on behalf of my co-collaborator, where's he going? Henry McEwen and myself, it gives us both great professional and personal pleasure in introducing tonight, Raphael Mineo, one of the world's most significant architects and architectural thinkers to what is this, and I had to count them, the eighth Mestine discourse. 
Since he was kind enough to help to accept Richard Murphy's invitation on behalf of the Academy, Henry and I, and I'll keep this brief, did travel to meet him in his studio in Madrid. With a stop further north in San Sebastian in the Basque Country, which we went by bus, that was the bus part of the route, and an opportunity to visit and appreciate some of his built work in the unique place which is San Sebastian. The time spent in his company and in conversation and his generosity was illuminating and memorable, and we do mean that, both Henry and I, Raphael. That includes his wine from his vineyard in La Mecurada, just a wee, in, wee slot there. The journey and conversation forms part of the booklet, which we've talked about, and we have assembled to the assistance of Raphael's colleagues, Christina Carriedo and Hayden Salter. Without them, it would not be possible to put that together, and neither was their own colleagues, Julia Radcliffe and Thomas Woodcock, and Matt, as Joyce has stated earlier. Raphael Mineiro's presence tonight has a profound relevance to and chimes well with the ethos of the Metstein discourse in bringing the very best architects and architectural thinkers in the world to Scotland. And tonight, to the assembled audience of students, practitioners alike, all at varying stages of their careers, and I include myself in that, to experience the ideas and work of someone formed through a particular and continuous pathway of inquiry, education, and reflection. Raphael Mineo is unique amongst an eminent group of architects devoting his life to architecture with an overlapping career coming that of educator and scholar, writer, critical thinker, and of course, practitioner. It's worth saying for perhaps the younger members of the audience embarking in their careers, his own education is a lesson in establishing strong foundations to an architectural development. Commencing at the Higher Technical School in Madrid where his early interest in and the philosophical combined with the practical, having the opportunity as a student to work with his professor in his third year, the eminent Spanish architect Francisco Sainz de Isa. And in graduation, travelling to Denmark, and this is no, by no means under, to be underestimated, being steeped in the Northern European architecture whilst working with Jorn Utzon, collaborating in the Sydney Opera House. As a postgraduate, yeah, and it goes on, he was provided with a scholarship to the Spanish Academy in Rome, his, this historic city and its academic additions being major influences as a career. As an educator, returning to Madrid as a teacher and then professor of architecture in Barcelona, which with his early work ignited interest in the USA, where he was invited and taught amongst other institutions at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and met with what become almost another family of critical friends, Aldo Rossi, Peter Eisenman, James Sterling, John Hedrick, Robert Maxwell, and Colin Rowe. And where today, even, as Jose Luis, a professional of architecture, he continues to teach. His teaching and scholarship has guided several generations of architects and is a mentor to special prominent Spanish architects, containing a continuous overlapping aspects of an intellectual, social, and practical approach, all inherent in the discipline of and importantly, the realisation of architecture and the understanding of its place in society, his work. He founded his practice in 1965, which had and has continued to grow and produce major influential work. He's a significant and prolific architect. At 84, and this puts us all to shame, he continues his architectural practice, continues teaching and writing. His studio is a Rafa Mineo Architecture studio maintaining a functioning practice in Madrid. To him, buildings are not isolated objects, but part of an evolved and evolving city landscape that together, together provides continuity. His buildings evolve through a series of varying strategies, emerging as unique, humane, and legible responses to their context, bringing together a deep engagement with the physical, cultural, and the programmatic. To quote Professor Mineo himself, what the site needs and what the building wants to become is paramount. Such diverse elements are assimilated and transformed through a rigorous process of investigation and interpretation, bringing to bear his vast knowledge of and critical approach to architectural history and precedent with those of the contemporary world. His resultant projects can be seen as a combination of a layered process of understanding and problem solving that provides for a particularly high level of organization and where from the outset ideas are seen as constructed forms 
derived from an artful and sound knowledge of manipulation of materiality and construction, can de can it collectively becoming works that can at once be responsive as type, provide meaning, and be at ease with themselves and their, and their setting. There's been an evolution through his work, seen through the lens of their cultural programs, their scale, their complexity and significance. From his seminal work at the Museum of Roman Art in Merida, through the Town Hall at Mercia, both, in my opinion, which now figure in the canons of architectural history, other notable buildings, civic buildings in Europe, Scandinavia and America, are there for all to be seen. And I'll cut down, I was going to name them all, but I'll cut them all. They're there to be seen and for people to research. Also, he may explain some of them tonight in his discussion and promenade through Madrid. His work has always been linked to his teaching and writing. And in our discussion when we were with him in Madrid, he finds this process both fascinating and exhausting. That's good to hear. He has published critical essays on his own buildings and those of others, providing for the reader a way of developing critical thought, and I would recommend those as further reading for all. His awards are immeasurable, major international. Some Joyce have spoken about the Pritzka. There's the RIBA gold medal and the premium imperiality, imperiality. And many more in Spain, France, Scandinavia. I could go on, but will not. His buildings are directly created to our current societal concerns of relationships to place, sustainability, place and sustainability, being purposed in a prism of usefulness and with that permanence and longevity. What Raphael Meneil offers us with his work and scholarship is a deep understanding of the importance and fruits of continual curiosity, of looking, study and learning, and as architects in dialogue with our profession is providing relevance through to our working society. Finally, and you'll be glad to hear that, to quote a fellow Navarrese, Raphael is from Navarra, the great Basque artist and sculptor Jorge Oetiza, whose own work has influenced Raphael, and I think in this case is apt in reflecting in the work of Raphael Mineo, the creator contains the work, and the work, the creator. With that, please join me in welcoming Professor Raphael Mineo. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for being here today. And also I want to thank Joyce Cranes and Harry and Tom who came to Madrid and we had uh, such a wonderful conversation that has been transformed in the book that I brought today and that make, uh, made such a, a wonderful work in helping people to, to present myself to the uh, to the Edinburgh to the Scottish colleagues and I am delighted to be here in Edinburgh in to offer the uh, easy Mestain's lecture in honor of, of his legacy as an architect educator and director of the Glasgow School of Architecture I know he loved Glasgow his adopted city and that he had the fortune of practicing there where his peers recognized his talent and his ambitious interest in discussing the most advanced trends of those days. Impressive works such as St. Peter's Seminary, Robinson College at Cambridge, or the Cumbernauld Technological College are clear examples of what it was his talent as an architect his talent and his ambition as an architect, because obviously his investment made the work that seen uh, with a certain distance, as I speak about how courageous he always was. For anyone who loves architecture, as did his investment, to share what you have learned is not only a duty, but also the pleasure. His investments enjoyed teaching and an, import, an important part of his professional life was devoted to educating young Scottish architects in the city of Glasgow. <clears throat> his uh, profound knowledge about architecture 
was communicated to his students with the passion he felt for his profession. Always uh, implies uh, such, uh, such a passion and to the interest to communicate it implies generosity, something that characterizes Easy Menstein as a person. I am pleased to remember him this afternoon in the presence of his family and former students. I share with him this twofold condition of architect and educator, and I have chosen to talk about my work in the city where I have lived, emphasizing how we have learned about architecture and a certain kind of knowledge is present in the buildings I will offer today as an homage to an educator such as Anissi Mestens. But before I talk about my work in Madrid, I would like to introduce you to how I envisage the city. And I would say some words about Madrid, because otherwise I would say that probably my talk will have, uh, will, will have any sense. Well, I, I have to say that when Philip II in the, the, the second part of the uh, 16th century, have the chosen Madrid as the capital of Spain. It was a very daring and a very independent decision. Many other cities in Spain could have, uh, could have been thought that, that deserved to be chosen as capital. Probably, first of all, Sevilla, uh, that had all the trade with the America, and Lisbon, who was in those days a joint kingdom with Spain, or if you look at the Mediterranean, either Valencia or Barcelona, or you look at the, the Castilian cities, first of all Toledo, that was the, still could be speak about the capital of a country, Toledo would be the, the very first, or many other Castilian cities, let's say Valladolid or Segovia, Ávila, or even Medina del Campo was a very important uh, market in, 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 in Europe. But he had, so I, don't, I, I, I guess that, that, that probably he was looking centrality for sake of this uh, condition of being properly informed and being connected with all those countries where he had interest, he has chosen this small hamlet, nothing more than that. It wasn't a new town, obviously. Uh, I think that the, the, the Madrid, who, which is a city where, as it, as it happens in, in Edinburgh, a city marked by topography, was uh, discovered by the Arabs as a very uh, strategic point between the, 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 the river and the point where it was the very first castle or the very first Alcazaba of, of the Arabs, of the Moorish, was uh, so many as 20, 30 meters. That, that means that it has a very prominent position in relationship with the, with the, 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 the La Meseta. The, 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 that came from, from Castilla and that announces the new way of establishing the, the, the Spanish geography with the Tajo, the Manzanares being a tributary of this Tajo. There, you see what was, this is a plan or a map uh, from 1848, a beautiful 19th century, let's say, calligraphy of how the, the beautiful description of the city just uh, by drawings and, and you see there what the, the Arab citadel was the very you, you see the, the, the palace the, the palace didn't have exactly the same you are seeing there but uh, very rapidly when the city was uh, let's say taken over by the Christians in the 13th century the city grew up uh, very rapidly and grew up uh, just uh, trying to keep in mind very much this uh, geographic contact with, with many other cities. Uh, still, the, 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 the topography and, and the geography of and the streets of Madrid 
keep the, the sense of a city that wants to be connected with the land around uh, as a rather uh, way of, of dealing with the, the, the territory in the very, I would say, still with a certain rural character. The streets in Madrid still bring the, the names of those cities, of those uh, uh, villages that they try to be connected. Still, the cities are Fuencarral, Hortaleza, Alcalá, Atocha, uh, Vallecas. All those names are related with cities that are around. And you feel in the uh, spider web that have the, the network of streets of Madrid, you, you have the, the, the sense that the, the city wants to, to, to keep connected with the territory very, very clearly. Was that was more or less what the, the city was in the days when Philip II made that the, the, the capital of the country, or the capital of the empire, if you wanted. And, and, and yet, very rapidly, very rapidly, the city started to grow up. That, that means that uh, at the end of the uh, uh, 16th century, the city had this, this kind of, of perimeter that was later on extended completely till the, the, this, uh, the, the, this, uh, this shadow of the city uh, is contained between the Manzanares, that is one of the rivers, and this other alignment that you see there, that is uh, for, th for those of you that know Madrid, is La, La Castellana, that is another kind of valley that then later has been overcome, but new valleys as well. It can be said that when the Bourbons arrived to Madrid at the beginning of 18th century, exactly 1700, the, the, the city have reached this uh, axis there, and that uh, this, this, this axis where the Bourbons start to think about a way of, of just offering to the city all those uh, facilities that didn't have, let's say hospital, let's say the, the gallery that became the Museo del Prado, the, the Mint, the, the Pool Fight Arena, the, the magazines for the storage of the wheat, of the, all, all that was going to happen. They are just uh, uh, offering to the city this uh, alternative of the, the, that the, the culture of the Enlightenment was able to offer to the, the, the city that uh, had been constrained by, let's say, by this. Uh, uh, the city was very much taken by, by convents and, and this, uh, not this sense of more openness that, that came with the, the Bourbons at the beginning of the 18th century. That just this jump that, that we have done for uh, describing cities by drawing to these new means of aerial photograph that actually allowed you to identify all that is going to happen there that is going to where we are going to be centered today. Because I, I would like to, to, to say and that one of the greatest things that could happen to an architect is to, to contribute to do something in the city where he or she lives and, and therefore and just knowing how much Easy uh, Menstein was uh, king of, of cities I, I, I thought that just trying to, to connect the cities with his architecture was something that makes sense in a session like this. And here, in, in a larger scale, still you see here where it was La Castellana that was there, is this, this line green there, the river over there, the Manzanares, and the other valley, that is where it runs now, one of the borders of, uh, of present Madrid, that is uh, one of those uh, uh, periphery roads that uh, encloses the city in something like uh, an Ormond. We see there now, we have changed. We were seeing north-south, north being there, south being here, and here, 
I, I had this fortune, truly, when I found that, at least that where some of my work has happened, serving not only just to my work, but more to the city itself. In a way, as you will see, many of my interventions had happened on existing buildings, and uh, so doing, I would say that I, I like to, to see my work very much contributing to, to the life of, of Madrid and uh, to the life of Madrid, of, of, of the city, not so much as just the, 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 uh, the chain of what has happened to be my work. I, I, I will, we will start with the very first that happens there, is a bank inter. Here we are seeing exactly as we have done, as we have seen before, moving from the, the drawing calligraphy of describing a city to uh, what uh, happens when you, you, you see that in this other way. North is there, south is here. And then the building we are going to see now is there, just the beginning. That is a building, it's a, a project of 1972. I was truly young in those days. Uh, I was in my 30s and I received this uh, commission that actually overcame which uh, could be considered my expectatives in those days. This is the building, perhaps and curiously, just because we are going to see all of them, that can be considered the most personal of all those. Many of the others are much more based on how the knowledge of architecture allows to do something and to, to, to work on existing buildings, considering the city as the, the, the final target of what a building should be. But in this building, that was the very first one in the early 70s, 1972, finished, in 1976, this building uh, allowed me probably to make some statements that could be considered more personal, aesthetic, ethic uh, statements, let's say. The, we need to do something with La Castellana that had became the, the, the place for the headquarters of big corporation and banks. And then it happens to us that we were asked to do something on this side that is uh, surrounded by the, uh, the fence, where it existed at an old uh, small palace from the nobility that was what the Castellana used to be, and we need to do something. And then I proposed, and uh, I had the fortune that it was accepted, of keeping the, the small palace and making something that could be seen almost like a kind of background that uh, uh, after establishing a certain strategy of how to relate both buildings, both buildings are keeping its independence, uh, both, both buildings are uh, nevertheless uh, working together in a way that cars are able to go down and so making this kind of distance to the parking garage below. And, and yet this uh, project that, that could be considered almost like, a, let's say, like a contextual building, a building that obviously tries to, or is very much constrained by the pre-existence, uh, the way the Italians wanted, uh, like to, to say that, but very rarely can be seen almost as only contextual. The, the, the building could be seen also as a building like looks for in those years, years when the brutalism prevailed, that was an statement about the, the, the quality both of windows as elements of architecture to be worked out. Uh, so the, the, the choice of the material with which the, the, the building was built that, and was based in the, the, the steel brick 
of uh, the small palacete, the small palazzo, and, and yet uh, I would say that uh, the discussion of those days when the 1972 six, uh, was six years later, the book of Rossi and the book of Venturi, and, and obviously some, let's say, echoes of what both of them said could be read and could be seen in a building like that. And yet also something that, that I like it is, uh, let's say, just accepting the, the trend of rationalism in construction that they could be said is one of the Madrid characteristics is there in a way the, the highest quality of craftsmanship was Jews and was Jews because that was the headquarters of a rather a small bank, a bank that is affiliated with the Banco de Santander and is called Bank Inter that ended that paying a lot of attention also to the interiors, always emphasizing the, the value of uh, the materiality as, as one of the, let's say, the uh, foundation to whatever architecture, the architecture instead of just enjoying paper and cardboard architecture should be uh, only, only that quiet is this true nature when built and so accepting materials. Also, this uh, came back into including uh, our artists' works in this moment, the, an artist like uh, uh, <coughs> Palazuelo. It's a, it's a building that actually, even though it could be seen otherwise, is very much careful with what can be called contingencies. It's a building that accepts uh, and includes this oblique line just for keeping the windows of the uh, Metro Giant uh, building. Is in a way, it's uh, perhaps uh, the, the building that could be considered more personal of all those that uh, we will see now. Uh, uh, personal, but, but also making this uh, statement uh, in those days valuable because, as I have said, the existing constructions were turned down to make room, and in this uh, moment, Bank Inter wants uh, to be the background of this other existing building. We finished Bank Inter in 1976, and in 1978, it was called a competition for making, and, um, making room and working in the Bank of Spain. The Bank of Spain is one of those <coughs> most characteristic buildings of La Castellana, built at, at the end of the 19th century. And then the, the building has the problem. This is the Bank La Castellana. Uh, isn't exactly the kind of architecture you have in, in, in uh, Edinburgh. It's, it's, it's very peculiar. Pro probably uh, it goes the way of what uh, was traditional art Madrid architecture in those days with the, the, the tip of the eye looking at the problem. Even I will dare to say that to, to Anglo-Saxon countries. And then the, the building started, as you see, they are, they are just turning down in this uh, one of those streets that are just marking the territory, La Calle de Alcalá, and was like that. But, but the building very rapidly, or well, not so rapidly, because we are now 1880s, 1890s. In 1927, it was added something like that. And then in the uh, years later, uh, in, <coughs> in the 60s, was added this uh, wing uh, over there. And, and you see also this isolated building in the middle. And then it remained. It remained this, this corner and build. It remained this corner and build there. And then it was the competition. We were six colleagues and myself, and we were asked how to do that. The, uh, that was 
let's say, a very, uh, an issue that, that probably a lot to, to think about and to reflect about what architecture is able to do. In those days, again, it, it can be said that many of those things uh, were uh, the, the, the discussion or the, the quarrel between whether <coughs> making, making the contemporary architecture, piece of architecture there, or just reflecting about which is the true nature of architecture. This uh, is explains to you how the, the, the building work in terms of, in terms of uh, let's say, establishing the perimeter. It's very, very easy, but, but you will see this uh, 19th century of just something that became canonical with the enlightenment, the main axis, and two lateral wings that are here. When the building was turned down, the, the building establishes <coughs> this bisect thrice here and makes this uh, facade to turn down. The first extension makes the, the, the same sense of symmetry there and that's there. And how you would be able to do that? All this part of the perimeter neglected what to be done with that. And then and that was the building that was going to turn down to, and then I, I dare to say that what to, to be done, it's 1978, that, that means two years after Van Kinter, and it was the moment when over simplifications of, of those uh, old styles uh, could be the way of affording a problem like that, and that was the way the building reached till there, and I propose very polemically that, that perhaps it was time to, to, to attempt that being built uh, in a very special way, uh, still we would be able to, to accept the old formal parameters to solve these issues. The, giving prominence to just um, seeing the, the building as a unity instead of just, uh, let's say, enjoying this continuous encounter. The decision probably has to do with an issue of a scale and I, I always thought that whatever you put there, whatever you put there in modern language could be, uh, let's say, another way of repeating exactly what has happened before. And instead, that what we should do was uh, complete that, uh, let's say, enhancing this uh, sense of unity of this 19th century building. And that, uh, well, surprisingly for me, I was uh, given first prize, 1978, and then uh, it happens that, um, well, it was the polemical decision, truly, and yet uh, it was kept in the drawer many, many years, and only the 25 years later, they asked, me at the, at the beginning of this century that we should go on. To tell you the truth, there were great doubts for me how we would do that. And instead, I decided to, to keep and to maintain the, 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 what we have proposed, but, but the building uh, acquires a, a density for, for sake of just uh, being more radical in the, the very first proposal, I, let's say, work out only with the skin, a thick skin, obviously, but in this case, the skin is, is something else. The, 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 the corner room there becomes this, uh, it was with occasion of the European bank that, that wanted to have some, uh, let's say, meeting room that is used from time to time. And then the, the plant is much more mature. As I am saying, that was developed in 2005 when it was finished. And the building is much more complex than uh, it was at the beginning. And, and in this moment, uh, what uh, it could be considered only a facade problem has become 
something uh, completely, well, something very much attached with the, the treatment of the interior. You can see the, the, the section that didn't happen. Here, the section recognizes the value of the huge window, these huge windows that obviously can't be, let's say, interrupted by those horizontal plans of the floors. And here, and that is, is what came out. Obviously, the, the problem now uh, is in, I would like to have built that exactly with the same uh, construction means. Uh, it wasn't exactly the same, but the, the, the truth, the nature of, of the stone that has been used there, is still that they are, and, and still, and then what the, could be, let's say, this not the strict repetition, uh, this, as you are seeing, is this kind of, you wanted, uh, it's not just a mechanical, but that using this way of simplifying all molding of, of figurative elements, ended up allowing the, 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 the facade indeed enhancing and indeed helping the building helping the building to to uh, helping the building to, to reach this sense of unity that uh, the, let's say um, mean or meant the, the fulfillment of what the, the building wanted to be uh, obviously difficult to say that that here the architect is personal things or took out the knowledge and, and therefore it makes sense that in this session that honors, honors somebody like E.C. Mason to, let's say, to emphasize the, the, the value of knowledge of a way of almost mandatory for practice or something that helps practice always has been something that uh, I have tried to do. The third project also has has to do with, with, with the Bank of Spain. But you see, it, it happened to me more or less moving this way throughout the years. We are in 19, 19, 1987, 1987, when the, the, the Spanish government started to talk with the, the, the Baron Thyssen about his collection. No doubt that for the Baron was uh, quite quite valuable the fact that this palace that the Spanish government was able to offer him the closeness to the Museo del Prado was a very attractive uh, let's say piece in the deal that they that they should be cut out cut cut on here is this corner uh, this is a painting of uh, La Castellana is there. La Castellana, the, still we are here under the Bourbons, 1685, more or less. La Castellana has become just a promenade, a promenade where the cars of the nobility are this kind of a spectacle, or at the houses, palaces of houses that defines the alignments of, of the streets. Here, something a bit more socially oriented, just this, this sense of making this, uh, like this uh, valley uh, keeping its uh, geographic uh, sense and, and, and also um, trans being transformed in something enjoyable uh, happened there. These uh, houses there that you are seeing there are uh, transformed uh, in this uh, kind of palace that is there in this corner. Now we are not going, <coughs> uh, I, I shouldn't explain you that more, more carefully. In some ways, I see it not in parallel, but the, this, the project that we have seen and this other uh, have something in common, so, something to, of, where uh, truly intellectual decision and, and truly, let's say, the strategy dictated but what you believe the, the principles of, of the architectural knowledge are what are, uh, had been uh, supporting the, the architecture you do. The, this palace started to be built 
from there, and, and it was built only part of it. Uh, from the main facade that, that used to happen in this uh, Carrera de San Jerónimo, above, to this uh, larger facade that uh, enjoys this kind of almost uh, naturalistic garden that was uh, built up in 1835. There are 60, almost 60 years. During 60 years, this palace has hesitated how to move on, whether the facade should be above, whether it should happen on La Castellana, and finally, that it could happen just uh, watching and overcoming the, the, the garden. That was the palace, and then <coughs> this is the... Then this is the... That was the main facade, uh, the woman in the drawing, that is still is attributed to Silvestre Perez, an architect <coughs> of the days, pupil of Villanueva, the architect of the Prado. The, the building has uh, something of the austerity, uh, this austerity dictated by rationality in the, the construction and mixing granite and brick and, and without, uh, let's say, any concession. It is whatever, but uh, just uh, uh, trying to, to prevent any arbitrarity that uh, could uh, change the, the, this sense that not only good construction is valid, or it's only what we should do. And here is uh, how the palace was. The palace went on, it, it belongs to the Duke uh, of Villahermosa, the very, uh, let's say, uh, protagonist of the, the Spanish nobility at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. And then, after several uh, incidences of, and contingencies that we don't need to talk about, the building was sold in the late 60s, early 70s, to, uh, to a bank, and, and the bank turned down entirely the, the interior of the building, and then, oh. same interior of the building, uh, want to say that was kept only the facade, and that, that is a new roof. There's uh, the, the entire uh, ground floor was this bank operation, uh, canonical bank of open space operation. And then that is what the, the building was shown on the, the, on the, the garden that I have shown to you. What in this moment, what we did, if, it, if I explain to you that the building started from there and hesitate what to be done when they arrived to this facade, and that has been turned down, that, that means that they offered to me the, the, the opportunity of just rethinking and just keeping the present of the perimeter with all those wonderful properly tailored windows, and then saying, well, let me invent and let me offer keeping the, the constraint, the welcome constraint of the, of the existing windows, how, how are we able to, to make and to rethink uh, entirely the building that started there, and now we are starting from here. Starting just knowing that that was going to be a palace-like museum. Now that the choice was to, to, to say the, the collection of Baron Thyssen von Misa could, could, uh, could fit uh, properly in something of those traditional museums, as we know of all palaces transformed in uh, galleries and in painting collections. And therefore, I look for the, the axis here in this uh, new large facade there, and we came out with this, this kind of uh, uh, establishing this sense of wall construction that where the, the walls are uh, running perpendicularly, perpendicularly to the existing facade when in the old existing building run parallel to the Castellana. Here, 
you see it more or less what happened. Above, I, I work out with this, uh, let's say, system of uh, skylights uh, just introduced by Sir John Son in Dalit uh, that still has been so useful for uh, uh, keeping uh, painting collections. And here, the, the, the building, how it looks like today, throughout these uh, large enfilades, nothing absolutely new, but again, and as I have, I have uh, shown you in the Bank of Spain, this, this sense that the steel, uh, let's say, uh, architecture could be dictated when handling and when dominating what you want to do without going out of what the knowledge and that you want to work with provides you uh, that ability to, to adapt the, that. Uh, and then we have the Prado here and we are starting in a new, in another project, another project again in La Castellana. I didn't look like just to work on in La Castellana. I, I very much would like to have worked many other places in Madrid, even in housing, but for some reason it has happened to me what I am showing you, and I, uh, something that I consider the fortune, the, the sense of just a fortune because and I am advancing and anticipating what I would like to be the end of the lecture, that art, this conclusion about how I foresee that architecture should do. And then there is the Prado, probably much uh, well-known building for those of you who have been in Madrid. And the Prado, the Prado, in a way, is a very special building, a building that indeed I loved and uh, I, I won throughout many incidences. Well, no, no, I won the competition, but it had a lot of difficulties to go on, but I was aware that should be done to, 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 to allow the building to keep uh, what I thought it, it was without making, because that went on uh, a procedure of an international competition, international competition that was open to put the Prado wherever. Instead of that, from this very first competition, I thought that the most natural way was enlarging the Prado colonizing and occupying what uh, used to be <coughs> the, the, the cloister of the existing Geron Geronimus uh, uh, monastery, that, that was palace monastery at once, and that then, instead of just making, uh, let's say, uh, going into the botanical, instead of just uh, enclosing completely that, you, we could, uh, let's say, try to, to, to solve that, because the Prado, since the disability that hasn't suffered any intervention, when you look at that, the, the Prado indeed is quite, the, the, the project is 1785, but this is Villanueva, actually, I don't know any other architect who do things so intelligent in Europe in those years. This, the, this main axis, it wasn't a gallery of painting, it was two, uh, uh, two-fold uh, orient, oppositely oriented uh, galleries. One that enters here in the higher level and then moves its way, and another that enters from the lowest level and then moves the other direction. That means that it's quite deceptive to, to see that as a kind of symmetrical building but it has altogether this assembly room where both academy from botanists and physicists uh, could meet together, maintaining each of them independently. What we try to do now, as I say, is just uh, colonizing and then going through the existing axis into uh, what used, used, used to be the courtyard that was in the conditions you will see now. Well, that, that is the, is an old, an old 
map of, of plan of Madrid, uh, early or well, middle 17th century, the plan of Teixeira, the, the Austrians, the, the old dynasty have reached the Castellana that is there, and the build up a, a palace that are those open, relaxed uh, courtyards there. The, this uh, palace mixes the, the religious life in the monastery with the, the mundane and with the civic life of the king and, and the queen there. This is, uh, uh, let's say, and those uh, surroundings of this, uh, uh, what remained of this monastery what was that, that, that was the cloister that should be recovered, that uh, was these uh, images from the beginning of uh, 1950s with all those cars, that was the situation in which the building was. Probably, uh, that goes very rapidly, to tell you that even though the Prado, since that didn't happen, it has happened that this main gallery with those two big small palaces in both ends uh, had been filled fill up with successive, successive uh, extensions ending up th 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 this way with this massive condition and with this shoulder completely, let's say, uh, completely neglecting the, the respect that, that the palace as a whole deserved. And here, uh, the model of the, the, the solution that went on, as I said, our strategy here was to keep this axis and move, uh, make, make here a rather reception space, maintaining the alignments, the, the old alignment is established by the monastery and the new alignment established by La Castellana and established <coughs> by Villanueva when he built up these uh, two, uh, <coughs> two academies in, in just taking the, the, or reinforcing the, the location provided by La Castellana. If we should have been able to, to use the, the, the land there, that, that means that the Prado will keep at once, let's say, the collection that are holding Velázquez and Goya. Otherwise, if the, the Prado was split, if the, the, the site to be chosen was out of this uh, sense of contiguity, in a way, it is contiguity what matters here. To, to allow this building to, to even to keep something of what it was, that where the building was embedded in, in being embedded in the slope, then this, this contiguity would allow the, the collections to be the, 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 the way it was. And therefore, it, it happens below this the, uh, garden above, uh, <coughs> this, this garden above, below this garden above is the, the, the access of the public, keeping this other access uh, as well, with this courtyard around the, around the absit of this assembly room that I have talked about. The, the first uh, Villanueva building was like that. The, only this gallery, these the two palaces, or these the two accesses, these two accesses, as I talk about this deceptive condition, because from here you move on above, from here you went on from below, and both with a big balcony entering from here, both academies were able then is this process of just uh, adding and adding layers that in a way uh, are again recovering something of what the topographically was the, the building when you create this, uh, uh, let's say, fake nature platform with the, all this parterre that you are seeing there that is emphasizing and keeping the courtyard with the absence is emphasizing this uh, central, mm, central role to, to be played by this assembly room. Being in that, you move all around here. 
and you move there. The, the building, uh, the Prado station was looking mostly for a space for temporary exhibitions, temporary exhibitions that happened there. The, the square above is the cloister, and, and then below it happens to be big storage spaces. Here is the, the, the space between both. Uh, I, I very much try to, to keep this uh, continuity of views that allowed the people entering into the building here to have in mind the, the existing absit uh, still by Villanueva. This is the treatment to be given to this assembly room that Villanueva didn't see finish. <laughs> when Villanueva thought about that, he thought that that was going to be almost like a, 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 a light like uh, or like, it, uh, like a uh, uh, chapel, and, and this has wind. It has columns around that. All those columns that somehow are suggested here, with all those uh, muses collection that was bought by the Spanish uh, king in the auction at the death of uh, Cristina de Suecia art uh, statues, uh, Hellenistic statues there. And then going up, moving this way, you go up for just uh, wrapping the, the, the existing cloister that was recovered after dismantling stone by stone and um, making around something like a shirt of concrete. And then above, it came out of the collection of sculptures, the sculptures mostly honoring the Oswalds in the, in the hand of <coughs> in the hand of the Leoni, that is the family of Italian sculptures that work here and in the Scorial. And here, well, I went on very rapidly with this image because that was one of the very first exhibitions, even before finishing the museum, that was open like that. And in this moment, I have been surprised, even myself, with this image. Those are temporary exhibition rooms in this moment. And then uh, the adjustment of the different levels, uh, just recognizing the value of topography here, again, brick, and the, this uh, quite the beautiful doors, I, I can't say that because that belongs entirely to the sculptress, is Cristina Iglesias. Uh, I, I always thought that uh, it could have an, an impact, the, this presence of this uh, independent work of art, independent in itself, and, and I think that she did quite well. She did quite well in this, uh, let's say, ambiguous uh, uh, territory where abstraction mixes with the stream naturalism. Most of these uh, pieces are cast uh, branches of uh, trees that create this, this sense of realism as well as abstraction. And here, the building, the way it works, the new entrance there, keeping the other entrance, moving there, and going through, you are, you are able to go up to the, the levels above. I think that it, it was very costly for me because through a very strong polemic, uh, I wasn't able to, I, I, I didn't want to accept any other commission in Madrid, and that has been a parenthesis in my life to do that. Uh, Thank God, I, I will say that it was quite welcomed by people, that the end people was very much agreed that that was a reasonable way of, of dealing with, with the problem and a very uh, wise uh, way of uh, managing the, the, the collection and the exhibitions by Miguel Zugaza reinforced the, 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 the opening of the enlargement with a certain success. It can be said that and makes this kind of connection. That 
the, the competition there was 19, 1996. 1996, 97, 96, and then later another competition at the end of, uh, at the beginning of the year 2000. Here is another competition that I won in 1984, and that uh, is, uh, we are now, we are now in the railway station of Atocha. Atocha is there. Atocha uh, well, was one of the target of the new established government because uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this end there has means that for making whatever there, it was needed to turn down an existing high over, uh, pass through elevated pass, high pass, that was going to be turned down. And then the, the very first competition went for, was looking for enlarging the tracks from 10 to 16 and connecting both long-term trains with, uh, with, with local and underground trains that are quite visible there in the different way of, of roofing. And that was the existing the first uh, railway station that instead of the 10 tracks that are there, it has six that were extended to 10 and then to the other 16. There's six more there. That was the old existing railway station. We will see later schemes that will allow you to understand better what happened. And then the entire operation <coughs> was that instead that just having ended up just um, being here six meters above the, the access of the trains, then they, they wanted to provide another and alleviate what the, the traffic here and make then there another entrance there. What means that this that used to be the main facade was going to give up for a new one that was going to happen in this platform. The moment when here are some schemes to allow you to think about. Uh, this is the lower level trains uh, are resisting, just going up very rapidly. And the main trains uh, starting to be built, that was a connection between Madrid and Aranjuez, that is uh, 50 kilometers south, and that was the very first station there with uh, the first uh, tracks to go there that were built there. And that is 1892. That uh, what you have seen there, a very modest way of enter two tracks in this, uh, let's say, two base uh, roof is changed in one of those canonical railway stations built by French builders under the direction of a Spanish engineer called Alberto del Palacio. And then if you, you, you admit that trains are not going to enter anymore in the old roof, and instead something is going to happen here, I would say that uh, allowing, the, allowing the cars and the transforming, the, bringing the main facade front the above to here below and, and so allowing cars to move through and, and also uh, just with a common roof for both the, the cars and the, the cars and, and the trains and, and then the, the other railway station, the railway station for local trains are going to happen there with those uh, the small domes that are covering and protecting a parking garage. Here, you see, after having built that, that, that the competition was 1984, and was opened the, the railway station that had been transformed from there into this other, the old, uh, the old roof, the, the old bolt became almost like a covered garden that has become a very uh, iconic image of what the station worked on. 
and then uh, when uh, that was open in 1992, in the train that went for the fair in Sevilla, the high speed trains, but then uh, 30 years later, no, no, uh, 25 years later, trains became uh, 400 meters and some new enlargement was needed. That is the, what you are seeing there. And this enlargement uh, acts for the new way of allowing people to go out. That is there. And something will be done over there one day when also this thing is going to be extended. And that was the, the drawing for the competition in 19... 84, and then instead of just falling in the fantasy of replicating in the larger scale the, the, the bolt, and I thought that this kind of hypostyle, hypostyle hole would allow and then taking advantage of just turning slightly and using the alignments would allow to, to prevent that of being seen only as a respectable space, so it's a forest of, of columns that are not easy to find out exactly which, where your eyes should be on to, to understand what we did. And here uh, I, I see these photographs just with, well, uh, quite astonishment how we were so courageous of turning down on that well, it's not my courageous either, it was the courageous of those who decided that this tension was worthwhile to make such an operation. You see in this moment, this uh, uh, rotunda helps because that was thought to be an in intermodal point of connection where trains, you have underground below and uh, buses around, that, that all that has been kept. The uh, underground went on into this, the site of this uh, street there. And here, this uh, very characteristic image of the railway station nowadays. In these moments, it, it was thought that, that because it was 1992, one year of celebration of the discovery of America, it made sense to make this uh, tropical garden where all the species coming from America could be put together under the same, under the same roof. Here, this dome that allowed to go down into the local as well as uh, buses to, to run around. Buses have lost now the intensity that they used to have when the station was open. And here you see the point of connection between the, the hypostyle dome, the new one, and the new one that somehow I decided that this would better don't repeat exactly what we have done. And the, the, the railway station changes, keeps this uh, hypostyle uh, typology, but uh, the roof is uh, work out uh, a bit more agitated. It was the present one. And that was one of the moments of people going out from the trains. And I think with that, uh, what the presentation of my words had finished. Now, in this very moment, we are still working in Atocha. Atocha is here. And we are working because the train connecting, of the, the, the high-speed train connecting the railway station of Chamartín with this one came down 10 meters lower than those that we have now. And then two tracks from here ought to go down 10 meters and so new uh, stairs and the system of another taxes from below, from the south, where the level will be easier, is, is going to be done. That means that uh, in a way, uh, a building like that is, is growing with the city, but it's also anchoring the city. In, in a way, the city is very much anchored by a building like that, or by a building like that. The other two, the Bank of Spain keeps, uh, let's say, its stature by itself. The same can be said 
about this is about these other buildings. Indeed, they are helping to, to the city to grow, and that is, is, is something that makes uh, uh, or makes or brings me to read the, the pages or the, the lines that I prepared as a conclusion for today's presentation. And I would say that having arrived to this point, I would like to say something about what it means to work in a city. I consider that it is not better fortune for an architect than to build in their own city to help it to define the future. The city, for the future of the city you love and that you know the best. Such an attitude allows us to discover that architecture reaches its fulfillment in the city and to recognize that buildings define the city image. But only, but only very rarely, uh, buildings are, are, are buildings isolated, independent objects. Very, very difficult to say that the Tocha is an object or that the Prado is an object. That they are something that, that keeps this sense of immanent, continuous growing that the city has. Uh, that can be said for whatever building, but indeed there are some that are allowing the, the growing of the city and that I like and I, I like to recognize. Buildings acquired their own value in their contribution to building up the city. And that brings me to talk about the notion of continuity and the architect's duty to avoid the violent disruption not the change, the change always is implicit in the idea of continuity, and, and the, not the change of the city once they understand the city as a whole. At, at, at the end, I'd like to see the way we work, just thinking that, that the, the city prevails on the, on the single building. Very rarely you, you find buildings that could assume its own let's say, independent autonomy and, and condition. The building should also think about that making then art, making the city and that the city probably uh, and allowing this uh, continuity of the city is what buildings ought to look for. Continuity is something that is embedded in the presence of the past and because the past is showing that they are establishing the link with, with, the, with the present, therefore implies continuity, and that is, is a still part of its actual reality, the past. But continuity isn't only an attribute of the city. It can be seen both in the city as well as in buildings. As I hope I was able to show you this evening, and that is what we like as the conclusion. To see buildings and the way they evolve as the foundation for the city's growth is crucial in my view. A growth that ought to be said doesn't imply inevitably pre-established forms, just the contrary. Continuity, be aware of it, anticipates change. But to recognize the immanence of the city's growth implies to accept the singularity the specific identity of the city. The pleasure and the gift of working, uh, of working in, in, whatever, uh, in whatever city comes from the fact of recognizing its singularity. The city, all cities have a specific identity. I, I wouldn't say that cities are the same, that cities have an let's say, own, I, I wanted to use the term personality, but uh, I would say that it isn't any repetition, even in the case, as it could happen with the, the city, the uh, new planet cities, at, at the end, any of them uh, coming out from the pre-established pattern or model ended up being the same. And I, I indeed, uh, if uh, there is a clear example of what I am saying, uh, Edinburgh would be the most 
striking and clear proof that this presence of the identity, the single singular identity of whatever city. Architects working all over the world should pay a tribute to the cities where they are working, recognizing this uh, collective identity is above any personal pursuit. And, uh, and I would like, after this uh, later consideration that I might make, to be offered uh, as a sincere homage to E.C. Medsain, who fruitful career we are remembering today. Thank you very much. <laughs>
from those moments when there is something very personal. I, I, I believe that just, uh, no, I wouldn't say giving up, but not making only personal architecture is, well, is more valuable for the city as a whole and to think in the city as a whole uh, with this, uh, considering that that is what has happened. Obviously, it has to to do also with the speed what we build today. And I think that what differences old city from new ones. I would say that old cities have the ability to to make, uh, let's say, to uh, go back and, and uh, to fit and, and to nurture themselves from failures on that they have time for, for, for adding with a certain sense of, of just making positive judgments. Now, what you build is, uh, uh, well, it's very difficult to, to, to test whether it is good or bad. And then you find things done so rapidly that you don't have the, the, the time for just adjusting from what you do. And then, all, all, all cities, uh, I would say, and therefore, that is one crucial point where the line between old and new cities is established. On how this notion of continuity could be useful and valuable, and actually, as I said, an asset. Thank you. Well, I'll ask the master in Spanish first, and then I translate. Okay. Bueno, maestro, primero decirle que es un honor eh, verle. Eh, usted fue profesor de mi padre en la Escuela de Barcelona en los años 70 y fue, usted fue la única la aspiración que él tuvo, la inspiración que él tuvo, fue la que me hizo hacer a mi arquitecto. Así que es un honor. Mi pregunta es acerca de, en sus cinco, de, cinco décadas de carrera, ¿cree usted que entendemos las ciudades mejor ahora? ¿Cuál ha sido un poco la evolución que usted mismo ha tenido sobre cómo entendemos la ciudad? ¿Y cómo se puede relacionar eso con conceptos nuevos como la sostenibilidad, la movilidad activa, el eliminar el espacio para el coche y dárselo de nuevo a los ciudadanos? ¿Y en qué manera usted en sus proyectos un poco eh, ha implementado conceptos que ahora son muy, que están muy en boga? ¿no? So my question was about um, how he thinks that we have over time and over his own career and just, uh, improved our understanding of cities and how they work and how they should be and also how concepts like he already used in his projects, like active travel, removing cars from uh, their position as a, as a privileged position, and how he thinks that uh, his work has actually improved and created that agenda moving forward. I don't know. Actually, I, I find myself puzzled by, by that. I, 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 perhaps I am being too close to, to the cities I know and, and, and then and therefore I, I try what, what we have learned is still being, being able to move ahead in, in, in the known city because if you take for instance housing uh, housing I guess that in this moment there are the far away cities in the Pacific those that are let's say, providing the more daring answers. And that, uh, those are, uh, answers are, are very often quite uh, is, uh, ignoring completely what uh, the, the old city was offering. And, and yet, uh, therefore, this uh, closeness prevents to me to, to foresee uh, what how cities are going to be, but uh, I, I, I try to, to um, let's say, to put on the discussion table the, the, the fact that if we still take help of the 16, you are moving just uh, in a safer way. I don't know how much safe is, is a value in itself, but uh, and I, I don't know how mm, this, there are many, many contradictions because by one hand, 
uh, what we build nowadays seems more, much more fragile than what the, the old cities have offered. And yet, uh, it seems that the, whatever investment in, the, uh, in real estate and in housing is uh, the, too much to, to allow people to turn down and to move easily in making correction on what you have done. Is this, uh, this, this, you have, from time to time we find examples where violent corrections to, let's say, uh, but construction has happened. But uh, I, I wonder whether uh, still the, 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 the economy of still would allow to do so. I, 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 I would like to mention even here in, in, in England, I wonder whether it's in Scotland either, but uh, it's in Scotland, in Scotland also. But I, 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 I don't want to mention some very blatant examples of things that have failed and that with only 30, 40 years old has been needed to be turned down. Uh, and this uh, ability to adapt that the, the old city had uh, isn't so easy to, to predict if it, would, if it would happen in the future. Um, I hope that notions of sustainability became a bit more clear than the Jews we are making of the term nowadays. I think that it's very unclear this is sustainability with the, the materials we, we are using. It is very difficult to say that this uh, way of seeing architectural forms uh, mostly just way of just uh, help with the uh, help with the energy to be added to the buildings is it going to last or not. That, that I, 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 I ignore the, 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 the input are going to have a concept like that in a very radical way because it doesn't make sense the, the experiences of, let's say, sustainable cities in the Middle East didn't are clear examples of what sustainability should be, you put all the factors of the construction at once, of, you consider all the factors of the construction at once. But the, uh, I don't want such a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably start in English and then I'll say in Spanish. Um, I'm actually from Merida myself. Yeah. Um, I've been here 15 years now in this beautiful country. Raining pretty much every day, but there you go. Um, I used to actually walk and pass by the Merida National Museum every time that I used to go to my school. And um, it will stay my, my breath away, and I think probably is one of my um, inspiration why I became and why I work in, in architecture and construction. And the question is, um, what do you think the National Museum will bring into the city? And how that building will change the city back in the 1980s? Um, so, so, soy de, de Mérida. Um, solía pasar el museo todas las mañanas cuando iba al, al colegio. Y um, siempre fue un edificio que me, me, me inspiró muchísimo. Probably igual, igual que Ángel, um, tú has sido una, uh, una gran fuente de inspiración uh, y, y, y la razón de por qué trabajo en la construcción, en la arquitectura. La pregunta es, um, en 1980, cuando decidiste uh, o cuando trabajaste en el museo, ¿Cómo pensabas que el museo iba a cambiar la, la, el, el urbanismo de una, city, de una ciudad tan pequeña? Y, y, bueno. y bueno, ¿cómo veías Mérida en el futuro debido a, a tu, a tu bueno. museo? No sé, eh, I believe that the Mérida case is, is very self-contained building in a way. I mean, very self-contained and very much a personal answer of how to proceed uh, in such a committed site as that. In a way, 
they are, if uh, I did something well, if some, was, was the fact that this is a project that is whatever but contextual. In those days, most of the population in this condition, in these circumstances, will have been to enhance the value of just making the ruins visible, and making the ruins. And instead of that, I, I, I say that uh, the building is whatever less contextual. It is uh, just uh, trying to say that excavating and making the foundations for a new building that moves uh, freely encounter this actual existing reality that was behind or that was below and that is what the, then uh, it wasn't calculated well having saying something about what the building means and then in a way uh, it is also affording some some issues about the true materiality of, of, of buildings I, I, I wonder whether uh, accepting as in the case of Merida so directly and so literally, something of this literalness has happened also in the Banco de España. And then that, in those days, uh, even now, would mean some courageous approach. Uh, a courageous approach that, that could be considered under this point of view personal. But uh, having said that, the, the answer to the other question you made is much more easier. Uh, I, and I didn't consider what was going to happen in terms of the change operated, operated in the streets around, just, just becoming and making the focus for tourism in a city like Merida there. In a way, it's, it's actual truth that entering into the main monuments of Merida, either the theater or the, the amphitheater of the theater, uh, or the <laughs> stadium uh, has happened and has been reinforced by the museum. Now that has made this thing something else, but it can be said that was planned. It, that is part of a wave of, of tourism invasion that, that somehow is reinforced by a specific event that happens to be the museum was. But therefore, uh, I, I would say that nothing to be with, with a planned operation. Uh, even otherwise, I, I wouldn't like that the, the streets have changed the way it has done. I wouldn't say that the streets have changed in a positive way either. And I think that now that the, the street is, is ugliest than it was uh, before all this activity came. And, and therefore, uh, the, the, the museum could have been left alone and, and could have been better to it. I think that the museum is resisting all what this, all these uh, uh, better conditions of the city. All, all, all Merida have changed a lot for better and worse at once, I would say. Okay. Well. Thank you very much. I would like to just to draw to a conclusion now and ask Joyce to take a Stands on to the stage. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you very Thank much. You. This Thank has been truly inspirational you, and aspirational. Thank and you. I think for all the students here tonight, well, well. something they will remember for a long, long time. <laughs> And thank you for sharing your vision with us. Thank you. Thank you now, yes. I have a very small no. token of appreciation. Yes. Oh, and this is the wonderful. RSA, the Royal Scottish Academy uh, Medal for the Metzine yes, Discourse like, for thank Architecture. Thank, thank you very thank, much thank indeed. Thank you very much, Joyce. Thank you. 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 Thank you.